Good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Um, I just, uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about data quality and adjustments. These are some of the most important things in climate science today because we have great problems with data quality and we have great problems with, adjust with adjustments of data. So I'm going to talk about both of those things. Of course, the data is being used to justify things like climate emergency. It's the hottest ever. We're, we're going to be burning up in 12 years. The oceans are going to boil, all this kind of stuff. But the problem is, is that the base data isn't exactly representative of reality. And that's what we're going to talk about here. Now, this is my town, Chico, California. Chico, California just declared a few months ago by their city council a climate emergency. Seriously. <laughs> And part of the climate emergency argument was, well, um, Lake Oroville flooded and the spillway collapsed. Seriously, that was their thinking. That was all climate related, not related to the fact that the Department of Water Resources didn't do their job in maintaining it. And then they claimed the wildfires, that the wildfires that destroyed Paradise, California, that's climate change. Not mentioning the fact that PG&E didn't maintain their power lines and arcing in the power lines caused the fire. That's the kind of stuff we're up against. But I showed several city council members this graph of data. This is from NASA GIS. And as you can see, in 1934, we had a much warmer temperature than we had in 2017 or 2018. And also, interestingly enough, even though that station is reporting every day, NASA GIS can't seem to find the data past about 2003. Go figure. So, it's not just a problem in the United States that we have. It's all over the world. For example, here's Darwin, Australia. Uh, this is a graph from uh, Dr. Jennifer Merrill-Hazy down in, in Australia. And she's illustrating here how one station is getting tremendously adjusted. The past is getting adjusted to make the past cooler. As you can see here in the, the green, um, oops. Trying to figure out this laser point again. Oh, there it is, separate item. You can see here in the green, this is the original raw data, and then there's changes in it. And then so they adjust the data downward. And that's part of what's called the ACORN data set down there. And it's happening all over Australia. Here is version two versus version three. And as you can see in version three, the warming trend has gotten steeper. How do you justify that, going from 1.3 degrees per 100 years to 1.8 degrees? How do you justify adjusting the past to make it cooler? I mean, the data is the data, right? Well, the idea that climate scientists seem to have is that that data, that old data, is unreliable in some way, so we have to adjust it. Part of it has to do with the way they're putting all the data together. We'll get to that in a second. Here's Iceland, the capital city, Reykjavik. And as you can see, one station, here's the original data, and then the red, the adjusted data. A big difference in the past, but identical in the present. Somehow they think that the data in the past needs adjusting. Here's the same city, and this is NASA's new presentation. And as you can see here, they have uh, the raw data versus the adjusted data. And so the trend, of course, will be steeper as you cool the past. From my standpoint, there's no justification for adjusting data. I mean, imagine if we were to take data from uh, any kind of uh, endeavor, engineering data, for example, like maybe on wind loading for bridges in the past. Oh, that data's old. Let's not pay attention to it. Let's adjust it to what we think it should be. And then use that to design a new bridge. How would that work? So which adjustments are correct? You know, we here have Reykjavik, and you can see that they've made a change to the data. And then just 155 miles away, they changed it the other way around. So we have these data adjustments that are going up and down on individual stations throughout the data set. Here in Washington, same thing. They're adjusting the data. Here's the unadjusted data. And then here's the adjusted data. They're making the airport warmer in the past. Why? What possible way could you think that through scientifically? What possible justification could you have? Well, 
they say they're adjusting for urban effects. This is actually uh, a screen cap from NASA GIS's website right here saying that we're homogenizing GIS data to account for urban effects. So what they're trying to tell us here, even though that's the original data down here and that's the adjusted data, that somehow Washington, D.C. was warmer in the past. Apparently the city was much larger 200 years or 100 years ago than it is today, right? That makes sense. That's how the UHI works, right? Go figure. What's the biggest reason for all this happening? One word, homogenization. That word right there is the sum total of the majority of adjustments going on in surface data today around the world. Now this is the official definition here. And basically they're saying it's a way of removing the, mo the non-climatic changes. Uh, they're taking out station jumps, station moves, changes in instrumentation and so forth and so on. Well that sounds reasonable. It does. It really does sound reasonable. But the problem is, is that when you do that, you're taking data from this station and this station and this station and using it to compare for the data for this station to make an adjustment. And so you're mixing data together. And the end result is you end up mixing good and bad station data. Now, you've heard of my surface stations project where we went out and surveyed over a thousand stations used to measure climate in the United States. And we used a rating system that was developed by a fellow by the name of Michael Leroy that uh, NOAA uh, adopted, rating them from one as the best to five as the worst. Of course, here's the famous station in Tucson, Arizona, in the middle of a parking lot. And for those of you that don't know the story, why would the Atmospheric Sciences Department, yes, that's the Atmospheric Sciences Department building there, why would the Atmospheric Sciences Department put a weather station in the parking lot? Of course, anybody with a lick of sense knows that it's warmer in the parking lot than it is over at the park. Well, the problem is, is that being a land-grant university, they originally had a certain amount of land. They started building more buildings, more things, more parking lots, and so forth and so on. And they kept moving the weather station. And they ran out of places to put it, literally. That's where it ended up. Just a couple of months after we exposed this, of course, that station was quietly closed. It had been gathering data since the 1850s era, and it's no longer doing so. But basically, we've got these ratings here of good stations versus bad stations, and it's based on proximity to heat sources and heat sinks. As you know, if you've uh, stood next to a building right after sunset, and this building has been in the sun all day, you can feel the heat radiating off the building at night. Well, that also happens with thermometers. Parking lots and things like that, buildings, will re-radiate their heat at night and heat the air locally near the thermometer. Almost all of the warming that we see in the surface data has to do with nighttime warming. And a lot of that has to do with the proximity to these kinds of things, parking lots and buildings. Here's an example. This is the official temperature center, uh, sensor in Ardmore, Oklahoma, right here. It's on the street, literally. It's right next to an, the intersection. Here's one not too far from there in Perry, Oklahoma, and I happened to take an infrared photo, and you can see the heat radiating off of the wall. NOAA, to their credit, after we exposed this, closed the one in Ardmore. It's no longer there. I visited it a second time to make sure. Of course, they never told anyone about that, but the data remains in the data set, and that's the real problem. We discovered in our surface stations project that Basically, 92.1% of all the measurement stations were affected by siding problems that NOAA themselves considered unacceptable. These are all the three, four, and five stations. The oranges, the yellows, and the reds. 92% of all the weather stations we surveyed in the United States had faulty data being produced. That's a big issue. Here's how it works, and here's why we end up with a climate data set that's faulty. The homogenization process compares stations around it. Let's say this is the station that you're going to homogenize. It's got a jump. Maybe it got moved, or maybe the instrumentation or whatever. So you compare the data with these stations all around it. Well, think of that data as being like bowls of water. Perfectly clear water is clean data. As the water gets dirtier and dirtier, it's darker, like a five. So what happens when you take clean water 
and dirty water and mix it together. You end up with more dirty water. There's nothing good about mixing bad data and good data. But that's what's being done here in the homogenization process. Stations are being adjusted using neighboring stations. And if those stations, and 92% of them, have been flagged as being unacceptable by NOAA's own siting standards, we're mixing good data and bad data. My study published some numbers based on acceptable stations versus unacceptable stations. The one and two compliance stations came out with this 30-year trend here, 0.204. The official NOAA record, all of the stations, came out at 0.324 trend. And then the ones that were bad, 345s, are 0.319. As you can see here, the majority of the data is being affected by the bad stations. And that's polluted data right here that's being used to make decisions. It's being used to make policy. The EPA used that data to make their endangerment finding. The trend differences here are pr pretty profound. Here's the best data in the blue, and here's the worst data in the red. That's the no-adjusted data or what they put out, what they publish in their monthly reports on climate, the red data. Well, it's really simple to me. Why are we using polluted data to make decisions? We've still got decent, a decent number of stations in the United States which we could use to present good climate data. Now, Dr. Gavin Schmidt of NASA GIST said at one time that we could measure the climate for the world using only 50 stations. And that goes to his idea that you can expand data out about 1,200 kilometers. That he says they're regionally representable. So we only need a handful of stations to measure the climate. Why are we continuing to use a bunch of bad stations and then adjust them to get a number or to get a value? But that's exactly what's going on. Now imagine if this were a stock market graph and you were trying to sell climate change as a industry. It almost is an industry these days, isn't it? Well, this wasn't scary enough, so we're adjusting the data and we end up with this. That's what you should base your decision on whether to buy it or not on, that adjusted data. Now imagine if they did that in the stock market. People would be arrested for doing that kind of thing. Imagine if this was used in a court of law. The forensic science people would say, the data's polluted. We've got to throw it out. It won't stand up in court. And that's the problem we have in climate science today, at least as the surface temperature record goes. And I want to leave you with a closing thought about this. Back in 2001, something was passed called the Data Quality Act, also known as the Information Quality Act. It was a small two-sentence add-on to another bill, basically a rider. And it's kind of toothless basically says that the government has to make sure the data they're using has quality control in it. But it really doesn't have any mandate. It really doesn't have any definitions. The problem with the Data Quality Act or Information Quality Act is, in fact, that it's toothless. What we need today, and I say this to anyone listening who might be in the legislative branch, if you really want to fix our climate problem, get out there and make a Data Quality Act that's got some teeth so that we're using good data instead of muddied up bad data. That will make a difference in climate.